If we're going to shift towards a more interconnected, personalized and data-driven approach to healthcare, then all the different parts are going to need to come together. Devices, drugs and data. Imagine we had a more integrated approach to how we do healthcare. It could revolutionise how diseases are prevented, diagnosed and treated. We're here in Sydney at the ARC's annual conference 2024, where we've been connecting with regulators, government and academia and many more to bring you a special feature episode of the podcast. Right now, you'll hear just a few of the conversations we've had in our pop-up studio at ARC. So once you're done here, jump over to the Talking Health Tech YouTube channel to catch the rest of the interviews. Collaboration starts with the conversations in health tech. Let's make it happen. Welcome to Talking Health Tech, featuring content and community about technology and healthcare. We acknowledge the traditional owners of lands these conversations were recorded and pay respect to elders past and present. Yes, I'm Tim Boyle and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of ARCS Australia. Obviously, we're at the ARCS Australia Conference here yes. uh, with about 1,600 other people mm -hmm. uh, and it's our biggest and best conference we've had yet to date. Yeah, and it's been, it's been a great vibe and we're, we're kind of in the back half of day two and I've got, I've got a bit of a sense that there's a little bit of a theme happening from each day in some of the sessions, but we've been busy here on the expo floor at the pop-up recording studio here. But um, tell me, I've seen you out and about and been managed to grab you for a couple of minutes here to have a chat, Tim. So what's been the vibe out and about and, and what's been happening in the sessions and uh, what's your take so far? Yeah, so this year the conference is a little bit different. So traditionally, our conferences have been broken down into streams. It's really three or four symposium and pushed together. Uh, and we run seven parallel streams across three days. Uh, but this year, it's a, it's a turning point for us. So we're moving from being a member association that's focused on professional development for the medtech and pharmaceutical sector to being really a, a professional association for everyone that works in the medtech and pharmaceutical yeah, okay. sector. So it's, it is departure from you know, an deliberate part of growing to fill the value that our members ask of us. Uh, with that comes a greater responsibility to provide value for some of our member areas that we probably haven't by a lot of value for in the past. Yeah. And did I hear right that it's 40 years for us? Yeah. So 40 years ago, the association was born as the Association for Regulatory and Clinical Scientists for the Australian Pharmaceutical Industry, okay. which is a quite a big acronym. Yeah. And it really was, uh, at that time... The precursor to Medicines Australia was all adopted, uh -huh. and they wouldn't let technical staff um, join. Okay. So it was a protest association to start with. <laughs> uh, and well, basically, over time, others engaged because the conversation became, became bigger than just uh, regulatory affairs and clinical science. Mm -hmm. uh, and now our membership has grown to be representative of the whole sector and every occupational, sectoral role that you can have. Yeah. And so, look at 20 years ago, us. Australia, or the long acronym I mentioned before, yeah. rebranded to Arcs Australia to represent. But uh, now it's we're we're relaunching as the um, as Arcs Australia still, but with a focus on the medtech and pharmaceutical profession. Yeah, interesting. And so I, I've noticed. Look, there's looking around the the room here, but also just in some of the conversations I've had with speakers and just participants, and the, the regulatory theme uh, comes through pretty strong. The, uh, the AI is coming through pretty strong. What are some of those hot topics and themes that you're hearing out in the halls? Yeah, I think that the big thing is the uh, convergence of technologies. Uh, yeah, so we've got a lot of medical technologies pervade. The, the, with sector that you can see them in our hospitals yeah. and some of the traditional technologies like beds in hospitals are involved in clinical trials information systems that uh, clinicians and clinical researchers will interface with uh, regulatory systems that capture information and dossiers but now we're seeing exponential technologies like AI pervade into them it creates you know, different ethical considerations how are they trained how are the biases in those in those solutions managed yeah and uh, and it's, it's creating more questions and answers in some respect. And uh, as you have seen on the plenary panel this morning, and I made the, the statement that 
Yeah, these tools make productive people more productive and lazy people lazier. You're right. Yeah. And, and you really need to put an ethical lens over the way you adopt these. Is it to cut a corner in saving time, which isn't the right thing, or is it to amplify your productivity to get a net, mm. net gain on top of it again? I like that one. I like that a lot. And um, I noticed too on the thing, because we've got a big day tomorrow morning recording a lot of conversations with the participants in BioBeacon, is it? Tell me a little bit more about what that's about. Yeah, so the conference always always had a SME startup stream, um, helped people build on the last day, and it hasn't been well attended in the past because it was sort of a mishmash of exhibitors and um, startups that were sort of side projects of of other people within the, the ecosystem yeah. of our members. Uh, but some of the feedback I've been getting from our members is really how we embrace our early phase technologies because every early phase technology has to go through the therapeutic development pipeline or pathway, you know, the innovation pathway to go from the bench to bedside. And the capabilities and the, the milestones required to get there are the services that all the exhibitors this hall provide and our members provide. Mm. And they're the value inflection points for for the um, the commercialization of these products. Yeah. So um, yeah, a lot of focus goes into incubators and um, special government funds for uh, staff support or entrepreneurship programs or ca- venture capital. Mm. And they're great at help they're like water washes the washes the technologies down the, the river or the technology readless level yeah. river. But the value inflection points are created by our members. Regulatory strategy drives um, pricing inflection points through the an IND or um, you know, a new product dossier for, for approval. Their value inflection points, once they've been granted and received, should uh, finish a clinic, positive result in the clinical trials, a value inflection point. Mm. So our members are directly involved in creating value for these startups yeah. and they want to know who they are earlier so they can engage and help them on their journey because the more technologies and more startups that are going through the local system, ecosystem, the more business there is for our members and their all boats rise on that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we changed it slightly and we put a call out to non-members, to, to the public, to try and find nine of the best startups that we can think of in the sector. And they range from uh, e-health solutions, support support businesses that do GMP manufacturing, yeah. there's, there's some biotechs, there's some device companies. So we've got a really good hex. A really good mix of male and female founders, mm-hmm. and we're gonna we're gonna showcase it. We're gonna shine the bio beacon, the light we're putting onto these startups, and we're gonna make a big deal of them across the year and promote them so that everyone in the sector knows who they are, what they are, what they're doing, and we give them every opportunity to succeed. Yeah, amazing, and we'll feature a couple of those on the on a podcast episode and all throughout our YouTube channel too. And that conversation is happening tomorrow. Looking forward to that. You know, I was thinking over the last couple of days too, and the, you know. We, we engage with industry bodies in the in the med tech space and the biotech and the software side and the health informatics and the startups have their own little circles too and that you know and, and it makes sense in, in in your description just then and like that example of biobeacon and how you know the, it uh, all, all, all the, the rising tide um, you know brings all the boats so it, it's it's you know for, for clarity for those that are looking at arcs and maybe seeing it from the outside and understanding well you know is this something that that we uh, engage with members or we become a member like how do you kind of describe where this fits into that broader kind of health ecosystem yeah well, firstly i think a lot of the initiatives aimed at showcasing startups are competitions yeah and there's, there's no yeah. competitions here in entrepreneurship we want everyone to win yeah right? we don't want companies failing we don't want others doing better we want everyone to be reaching their full potential mm. so that's a big part of it but in terms of the holistic ecosystem of our, our membership we what we but like the way we work, yeah, there's there's a role for everyone that's working in the medtech and pharmaceutical sector to be an arts member. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really about aligning the professional journey uh, and, and the training required, professional development activities, the network of support that will enable people to excel professionally in their career. That's what arc bring, arcs brings. So mm-hmm. you, you could be a clinical researcher, we work in regulatory affairs, we have medical information writer, work in market access, mm-hmm. you could be a business developer, licensing, or be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. There's something for you to learn by being an ARCS member. Uh, we recognise our members through post nominals. Yep. For those that can demonstrate competency against our competency framework, which you lost this morning, we have a chartered membership status. Yeah, cool. So we're, we're really driving elevation of um, officials in the sector 
Yeah. Engineers have it easy. Yeah, engineers Australia, okay. um, they have different sectoral colleges based on if you're a chemical engineer or a biomedical engineer. Uh, same, yeah, chemi- uh, for the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. And then there are another professional association that have professional development pathways yeah. and professional recognition. And ARCS is taking the role of the professional association for the medtech and pharmaceutical. Yeah, got it. That makes a lot of sense. Hey, lastly, Tim, the thinking about, uh, you know, with we're being about halfway through the, the conference already. What are you hoping that people will take away from this session? And maybe what can we look forward to seeing at uh, future um, ARCS events for, for members and, and maybe this time next year? Yeah, so the, the key takeaway is that we can't do it all on our own. We need yeah. to work as a team and we need to work collectively. Competition between... Um, between our members and the organisation they work through is, is an important part of, of excellence. Mm-hmm. But also, we need to embrace collaborative competition if that's if that's a thing, or competition, so that we all we don't we don't really shut down. Uh, you know, we don't drown people in our in our you know gas yeah. for competition to gas for air. That's what a healthy ecosystem looks like and a healthy membership organisation. Mm-hmm. That's one of the key take homes. There's so much upside to be gained for working and professionalising our sector. Yes, and that, that's what we're working to achieve. So that, that's the big take home. I would just say that we're going to grow exponentially each year. This year is about ten percent bigger than last year's conference. And I, I think we'll see that trend. There might be fifteen percent next year, or ten percent on where we are. Yeah, and that trend should grow, especially with the changes we're making towards being a professional association. Yeah. Matt Dunn, professor of pediatric hematology and oncology research from the University of Newcastle at Hunter Medical Research Institute. Um, I'm a National Health and Medical Research Council investigator. Uh, I'm the Director of Brain Cancer Research at the Precision Medicine Research Program of the Hunter Medical Research Institute and Leader of Pediatric Research at the Mark Hughes Foundation, the Centre for Brain Cancer Research. Um, I'm a translational biomedical scientist uh, and have a preclinical research group focused on pediatric cancers, uh, particularly tumors of the brain stem, known as diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, and also of hematological malignancies such as acute myeloid and acute lymphoblastic leukemias. So we focus on uh, kids' cancers and the cancers that take more children than any other disease. Yeah. Unreal. Like, super important work to do. Uh, remarkably complex, in my opinion. Um, but what brings you to, to arts today? Like, What's the tie in there? Um, I was invited to speak uh, and share my journey. Um, so not only do I lead a preclinical biomedical research group focused on paediatric cancers, um, but my daughter was diagnosed with a brainstem glioma back in 2018. Um, at that time, my research group was focused on paediatric leukaemia. And, um, and when Josephine was diagnosed just before she turned three with DIPG, I immediately added DIPG to my research focus, yeah. uh, started researching in real time. Kids with DIPG are uh, given less than 12 months of survival post-diagnosis and we have no effective therapies for the disease. And so in real time commenced my own research program aided by my staff and students and, um, and subsequently um, in the last six years and since Josie's diagnosed, um, we've started two clinical trials. Um, we've discovered three drugs and combinations of therapies and we published more than 80 pa- peer-reviewed papers in the field. Wow, unreal. Like such, um, you know, the, the, the personal element, the, the drive and the passion there, I mean, that really comes through and, and one that has impact, I imagine, then at a, at a global scale in, in such a, a tricky area. So the, the, the tie-in with, um, you know, th- this particular crowd here at Arts, where we're bringing together all the points around drug discovery or, or, or diagnosis research and all the regulatory piece, how does that kind of tie in with, with what's happening here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question and one I didn't really understand until I just attended that plenary session. Yeah. You know, in medicine and in regulatory um, aspects of medicine and, and drug delivery on drug handling, I think what we've done always is to base our data on what happens through a clinic and a patient response to a therapy and we haven't really taken an uh, the considerations and the experiences of our patients in yeah. consideration very much. And I think over the last decade, I, su- I suppose, and thanks to Karen Woolley, who used to be the president of ARCS and continues to work in the, that patient advocacy role and linking that with clinical trials and drug development, there's much more of a focus on what happens to the patient rather than just what happens with the drug. Um, and that experience... It's not only helping to improve our medicines, but also improve 
uh, the journey of a patient receiving those medicines. And, and as we get more technologically savvy and there's more parents and patient advocacy groups starting, we're getting a lot of research done outside of the traditional means of research. You know, parents and patients are doing their own research, starting their own groups, starting their own advocacy organisations, and there's a lot of data being generated. And, and I think one thing I've learned today is that, you know, that's important data. We try and capture it. But if there's a framework of how that data is collected, collected and analysed and then used rather than just sit in the periphery, then as a community of drug developers and therapeutic and medicines developers, we can learn a lot and we can get to the better outcomes space, which is everybody's goal here. Yeah. Um, more informed, um, just see- seamlessly and, and taking everyone's lived journey into, into consideration. Yeah, there's something in that about, you know, taking those really specific or personal stories and those shared perspectives in that kind of non-structured way that to be able to then do something with that information where sometimes it feels like if you're, you're impacted as an individual by a diagnosis or, or, or medically in some way that there's no real way to impact the kind of uh, have, an, have an impact at scale. But if there's a way for us to take those stories, I guess, all those unique perspectives, but then to aggregate that at a point that and then have impact at, like, say, an industry level, I, I feel like that could be um, by transformation. So I, I, I can see the, the vision there for sure. And, and then lastly, what would you hope then that perhaps people take away from, from arts? There's a, there's a variety of different sessions and, the, and the, the colliding of many different people in the, the ecosystem. From your observations in this only the first couple of hours, what, what, what people take away from this one? Look, I'm hoping that, you know, that conversation piece... Uh, between all the stakeholders becomes more embedded and, and, and not not seem to be an extra challenge, but actually helps to value add yeah. to the development space, the drug development space, you know, integrating the research at the preclinical level um, through experiences in clinical trials and then having families and parents and patients all part of that journey, then informing regulatory organisations in a more fluid and dynamic way I think for the diseases where there is huge um, scientific and drug development um, that still needs to occur in my space and in the cancers that we work on, it needs to happen quicker because in Australia, you know, every two weeks a kid's diagnosed with DIPG and every week can diagnosed with leukaemia. We need to make those inroads to better outcomes more quickly and I don't think we can do it just as a research group or just as a clinical trialist yeah. or as a regulatory organisation or particularly as a family, those, the, all of those things need to work together and we need to foster in and support those things and learn from them and do it in a way that we can get data out of it and, and improve the journey for the next patients to come along. My name is Guy Zipnak. I'm uh, the founder and chief scientist of Evidently. We're a real-world data and real-world evidence company. And we're here to talk about the use of AI to enable AI, actually. So we, we use AI to clean up the messiness and uh, rectify, harmonize real-world data. So it's usable for applications such as AI. Mm-hmm. So you, you've answered my next question, which was going to be, we're here at ARGS, what are you talking about? I know you're presenting twice. Um, both after lunch today. Can you tell me a little bit about what your first presentation is on? Yeah, the first presentation is uh, more, it's slightly technical, but it's about, uh, it's more about the AI that we use to clean up data. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a proprietary system with, um, that we developed specifically for this problem. It's uh, quite a different approach to what is traditionally used. Um, so I'll be talking about that and explaining how that works. Okay, I'm not very technical. So can you explain to me how the approach differs to the sure. traditional way? The traditional approach is to take a lot of data, put it all in one bucket, train an AI on it, and then use that AI to try to make sense of another data set. Yep. In healthcare, that doesn't always work uh, because the data sets in real world are very different. Sometimes even just two different doctors in the same hospital will have different data. And so there's a lot more variability. And, and that approach, is it, it works to a degree, but not well enough for the needs of the pharmaceutical or evidence production uh, and healthcare in general. So our approach instead is to take all this big data 
is first of all to ignore everybody else's data because that cannot really help us to take the data that we see divide it into small chunks and then use an AI to develop an AI specifically for that chunk and then we put it all together and we call that process uh, agile AI because it's it's choosing different algorithms. It's choosing how to divide the data. It's um, it's constructing training and AI. So, in a typical data set, we could have hundreds of AIs being generated and used, which is too many for anyone to generate. So that automation of that process allows us to get very specific, very high precision. Yeah. For each chunk of the data, and then overall, we get very high precision across the entire data set. Very, yeah, okay. I need to come to your talk and, and uh, learn a bit more. In your second talk that I think that follows on pretty quickly from that one, Wardle. Uh, so that one is at the end of the day, I'll be on a panel summarizing what we're seeing today, what we heard today. Okay. So I don't know what I'll be talking about yet. I Fair enough. to the sessions. And All right. See. Well, then, based on what you know you are talking about right. and your experience at ARC so far, this being day two... Have you got any any insights for, for us? Well, I I'm I must say that walking around uh, arts, I was a little bit. It's not what I expected. It was my first time at arts, mm-hmm. I expected to be a lot more big pharma and a lot fewer companies that are like surrounding support and services companies. I, there are more here than I expected. It was just great. It's great to see that the big pharma is not really Australian, but these companies are. And so that's, that's great to see. I'm really happy about that. Well, my name is Andrew Wogan, and I run a coaching and leadership business called uh, Adora. And we're a global leadership and coaching business that serves the med tech, pharma, biotech, health tech um, world. Yeah. So tell me about a little bit of the challenges that are going on in kind of running companies in the NetSpec space at the moment. Who's coming to you for help? Yeah, I think we have lots of different groups from executive teams to CEOs for one-on-one coaching to also working with um, teams throughout the organization. I think what people are realizing is we live in a very busy world and there's a lot of change happening at the moment and you really need to spend time developing your people and giving them tools and frameworks that they can actually call on to help them um, lead themselves better but also work more effectively co- collaboratively mm. and um, really to help have tools to build high performing teams and what we do is we give exec teams and their leaders visual tools to help them be able to communicate more effectively, deepen relational trust be more aligned, I think sometimes we're very busy in this space and alignment can be an issue. We can think we can be aligned, but we're not aligned. And then we're wondering why we're not executing effectively. And you really need to build capacity. Um, and that doesn't mean have more people. You're building capacity and leadership skills with the people you've currently currently got. Uh, so you talk to me a little bit about some of those frameworks. What do you see is really important in this particular space for leaders to bring yeah, well, I think we've developed a framework called the Maximising Team Performance Framework and we really need to start at the foundation, which is communication. Again, everyone to understand their leadership style, how they communicate and lead and how different they are to other people on their team. Because embracing diversity and being more inclusive is key. But sometimes we communicate and lead how we would like to be communicated to and led but we need to remember that the people that we're talking to can be very different to us and giving teams skills to make sure that they understand their own strengths that people first understand who they are what their superpowers are what's their core strength as a person what areas are always going to be a challenge for them but importantly then learning to bring out the superpowers of the people they work with and one thing we sort of see quite frequently is you need you need to have frameworks to help make sure that when your teams are working together, that there's people with different leadership styles working together, not people with the same leadership. Yeah. So and making sure you're hearing everyone and getting that psychological safety so that you're not just hearing the more forceful, powerful voices, that you actually have frameworks to help make sure that you've got rules of engagement framework to make sure you're hearing everyone on it. Because sometimes the quieter voices, least forceful, have great 
great opinions, great ideas, but we need to make sure that we're empowering them to be heard. And that consistency as well. So I'm sure you've got many leaders in an organisation whose staff want to know that they're getting a similar kind of leadership style whereas when we go, the frameworks would really help with that. I guess you talk to so many leaders in the space, in med tech, or in the regulation space. What's happening? What do you put the trial and demo and was like, hey, see, at the moment in space? So lots changing. You've got AI. The whole theme of the conference is looking into the future. What are you seeing as the real challenges at the Yeah, well, the workshop I led yesterday was on change. So there's lots of change happening. And how can you communicate and lead change effectively? For, for your people that that's really important so, you know change it's an easy it's an easy word to say but you need to have frameworks to help make sure that your people are buying into the change that you're actually listening to them getting their opinions as you're as you're actually rolling out change and what we really notice is one of the most important things I spoke about is not only communication but in in leading change you need to have a very strong foundation of trust in in in, in the business that people trust you they trust the change that you're rolling out. I think another big challenge is retention of staff. Mm. Keeping staff and um, training up staff, being sure they want to stay with the, with businesses and also engagement of staff. You know, Gallup some some great data recently around that in any one organization seventeen percent of your staff are disengaged. And why do you think that is? Oh look, I think change some people don't like change, so maybe they start to switch off. I think also if people don't feel connected to the organization anymore, we're working in a still working in a bit of a virtual mm. virtual world. And I think that's why companies need to look at investment and leadership programming steeper. People are your biggest asset, but they're also your biggest liability if you don't invest in them. But I think in the fast paced world we're operating, I strongly believe that you can engage, motivate the staff by developing them, just spending some time on some workshops and giving them tools to be a better version of themselves. Sometimes we overly focus on all the technical um, stuff, be it reg, clinical trials, training our people up on diseases and products, but the soft skills part of the business is, is actually so important how you can empower your people to bring their best every day to work, to be the best version of themselves. It's easy when we're stressed and under pressure to be very accidental in how we lead and behave, but getting them to think, well, how can you come to work, be more intentional in how you show up in a meeting, remembering who you are, what's your leadership style, who's everyone else in the room. And it's not only about internal. A lot of the work in the med tech and um, pharma biotech spaces, we have to operate very closely with our external stakeholders, government, healthcare professionals. And sometimes we can be that best version of ourselves outside the business. I say sometimes when I was working in Salji and I was the um, good teenager with my external stakeholders, give all my energy to them. But sometimes was accidental of the naughty teenager inside the business. What we need to realize is as employees, you need to try and get that balance right, both sets of and um, stakeholders inside the business and outside are equally, equally important. And how do you get that balance? And well-being. Well-being is another key component. I think burnout's an issue. It, in this sector, we work ourselves very, very hard and realising that sometimes it's not a good thing that we don't have that balanced productivity at home and at work, which is critical to... Um, being the best version of yourself you don't want to just go home when you're too tired to engage with your family and spend time with them so well-being I have a talk on it tomorrow on well-being and some tools around how to help your people and um, realize there's you know you need to operate in different gears every day and, uh, and with different people and to think about yourself what are you doing to for self-care for you self-care recharge needs to be every day for everyone and when you coach people and talk to people sometimes people don't do anything for recharging no exercise it's a full-on job being a leader i think today in any industry particularly in health or any pharma biotech med tech space it's um no mean feat and final words before you wrap up about ARPS, the conference about kind of what you see next in the space Oh, look, it's always great to come to ARCs. It's a great um, networking event, number one, because it's in, in person and we, and we miss that. And it's great to have these great minds 
come together and Tim and the team have done a phenomenal job with um, the sessions and people are always excited about it. It's a business development opportunity for the companies who, who are here, but it's also just that connection to have it and really to hear what's happening on the ground with the leaders is so important um, for us in Adora Leadership and Coaching. And if anyone would like to know more about what we do, they can go to our website, adoragroup.com.au and find me um, on LinkedIn. And it's a real pleasure. It's great to have Health Tech talking here because I think sometimes this industry can be quite shy about presenting so it's you know you're putting us out of our comfort zone coming to present (laughs) yeah so thanks so much for having me Nick Northcott from uh, a few different places so uh, Chrysalis Advisory yeah Um, we're a full service advisory business for health medical research um, Mm -hmm. sector life sciences sector um, Udemont Technologies, which is a scale-up med tech, about 10 years, $15 million capital in, in the sexual reproductive health space. Okay. And also chairman of Enesol, which is a leading global um, medical device, quality assurance, testing equipment manufacturer. Oh, cool. Excellent. So, yeah, definitely wearing a, a few hats. And I see the Chrysalis booth over there and, and, and good presence here at ARCS and supporting BioBeacon as well. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, really important to start, you know, support the early stage space and something we're really passionate about. It's really hard to start a company and found a company and get yeah. get it through the valleys of death that keep going forever and ever yeah and um, so you know we, we want to really support that journey yeah excellent for those that don't know chrysalis is that is that the, the kind of work that chrysalis does that's supporting yeah we, we basically play in four markets right so um academia medical research institutes so i used to to, to run one of those so I understand that world how it works mm-hmm. the early stage companies and assets that come out of um predominantly those worlds yep um uh, the health system as well. So how do you actually translate those assets mm-hmm. into the health system and, and make sure that you can have uh, a, you know an evidence-based healthcare system? Um, and then the capital markets and the funders, how do you actually make all this stuff work? How do we do deals that get us to where we, we want to get to? All the hard bits. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. but the, And so you, you're, uh, like we said, representing in a, in a few different parts, playing in a few different areas. You've got the crystal stuff, but also tell me a little bit more about uh, the organisation that's taking part in BioBeacon itself. So, uh, 10 years ago, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation turned around and said, we've got this huge global problem. One million sexually transmitted infections per day. Increasing, yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. Increasingly um, antimicrobially resistant too. So, you know, gonorrhea, that doesn't go away, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and over 120 million unplanned pregnancies. So, it's about a $60 billion global burden of disease. So, the only way to actually stop that right now is via a condom. Problem is... People don't want to use a condom, right? <laughs> right. It's, it's a disruption to the experience. Um, yeah. Doesn't feel as good, and, and that's the key point, right? It yeah. doesn't feel good. Yeah. So the challenge was, can you create a condom that feels better? And so, um, Professor Robert Gorkin, who was um, uh, working in three D printed biomaterials at the University of Wollongong, is like, you know, looking at this stuff, going, oh, maybe I can, maybe I can make a condom out of this. And so, you know, fast forward a few years and there's a Gates grant of, you know, 100 grand and then a million bucks and um, there's a you know, early stage kind of lab work done. Um, and then Robert, um, Simon Cook and myself co-founded Udemont Tech. We signed the IP out of the universities of Gates yeah. and Udemont Tech was founded. Um, so we've been on this whirlwind journey to create the next generation um, hydrogel condom, which is... Um, if I maybe just give you a quick lesson in condoms. Sure, please time. do. Yeah. It's basically three types of condoms. So there's latex, natural rubber latex, yeah. which is rubber, right? Mm-hmm. So it's got all the things that put you off, smell, taste, um, the touch of it. It's a raincoat, right? It's, it's a smelly raincoat. It's a smelly raincoat, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you've got synthetic latex, which is polyisoprene, mm-hmm. right? So it's like the soft one. Okay. And then you've got polyurethane, which is a plastic. Yeah. So it feels thinner, but it... You know, there's reasons why it's not as good. Yeah. So we've created basically what's a hydrophilic um, material yep. um, that has water inside it. So it's inherently lubricious. So um, you can kind of almost like feel through the material. It's entirely clear, has no allergies. It's um, a completely different kind of feeling material. So the idea is that we create something entirely new, disrupt a market that has... Um, not been disrupted for you know seventy plus years. Yeah, and um, use advanced manufacturing techniques and digital QMS and all the cool tech that you think yeah, about to 
to, to create a, a disruptive proposition. Yeah. So does that fit in the, in the category of, what is that, medical device? Is it consumables? What's the... Well, what yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's absolutely a medical device. So yeah, it's right. a class two medical device. Interesting. Um, because if you think about why, why, why did condoms come about, yeah. trying to stop a biological pathogen, you know, yeah. e.g. HIV or AIDS, um, from infecting somebody. Sure. So you've got to make sure that you've got this thing that you're supposed to make feel like nothing yeah. actually stop uh, a pathogen getting through. Mm. Well, the bar's pretty high too. Like if it if if it fails or if something doesn't go to plan. So like I, I imagine then that you know the reliance on the technology. A lot of people you know just expect that these things work, and there's a lot of kind of trust in that process. So um, I can understand why the process would be quite a long one to make sure the thing kind of works. So. Yeah, and and you know so you're going to do pilot clinical trials. You're going to do pivotal clinical trials. There's huge manufacturing. Um, there's 27 billion condoms produced a year. That's a lot of fun. Exactly. So you've got to have a really high yield. You've got to have really high quality. You've got a really stringent ISO standard. Yeah. So a lot of manufacturing technology and capability to to actually be able to produce at scale consistent condoms that feel like nothing but don't let pathogens through. Yeah. Really difficult technical challenge. And what stage is it it at right now? Yeah, so we're um, 10 years from idea to today. Yeah. Um, we literally had database lock on our pilot clinic trial this week. So that's a massive milestone. So, you know, kudos to the team. Well sure. done. And what that, what that means for us is that we're now at this inflection point of value mm. where we have proven that we can consistently make the product. Um, we've got really strong signal that there's preference yeah. around the product. So how do we take it from, you know, the thousands we can make a year to millions and ultimately billions of products are so scaling yeah. advanced manufacturing running a pivotal study which is basically 300 plus couples having sex um yeah. i guess a, a predicate device i was gonna i was gonna ask I, i've been very mature through this whole conversation yeah, yeah. We, so you can take it wherever you like <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what is that yeah they always gonna ask what's that clinical trial look like but yeah you can be as descriptive as you like. well actually <laughs> you know so we started off with handling studies so like touching the material yeah. um we've done that in australia and overseas and asia and different markets and mm-hmm. you know how do people respond to that we've also done neuro studies so like you know eg meg where we like look at the the neurological response that people have when they touch these materials. So there is a different response. So you touch rubber, a balloon is a balloon is a balloon. Yeah. And you have a, I know what this is, and inherently that's not very enhancing to the experience. Whereas you touch our materials, um, there is a a novelty response in the brain. Now, Mm -hmm. can't make the scientific claim that that's anything more than a novelty response at this point, but you could over time potentially get to the point where, you know, there's some link to arousal pleasure yeah um and and maybe that's why that's linked to that that kind of preference mm. so we kind of did that kind of handling study neuro work by feedback work we also did um what we called protocol optimization studies which is a nice polite way of saying an individual utilizing the okay. the, the unit um yes. and then um sex studies which is you know a couple um you know util- utilizing the product to make sure it actually works utilizing the product nice nice feeling but the um uh and you're here at arcs and you're, uh, it's, it's part of BioBeacon, and there's a lot of different organizations and representatives from across the, the industry, across the pharma side, the regulatory. Like, what are you hoping to get out of the, the participation in, in BioBeacon? I think from a Udemon tech perspective, it's about uh, being part of the ecosystem. It's yeah. about, you know, um, popping our head up now. We've been reasonably quiet about what we've been doing. Yeah. Um, and so communicating, you know, this here's where we've come to, getting a bit of feedback about, what do people think about where we're at and mm-hmm. what the next stages might be? Yep. Uh, and probably letting the world know that we're here. Yeah. And what are the next stages then? And what, what can we expect to see? And when would we start seeing this in the hands of whatever else of people? Yeah. So the next stages are um, to to fund the journey. Yeah. So, you know, obviously scaling manufacturing of that size is, you know, we hear about our lovely Prime Minister's made in Australia policy. Well, we, we, we need to manufacture at scale. So we need to build that scale manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Uh, run the pivotal study, get regulatory approval, and get into market. Yeah. So there's a funding element to that. There's also a conversation about partnering around that. Obviously, it's a huge global market, pretty consolidated as well. So we're we're looking at that right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, after that, it's you know probably within three years we're on market selling and yeah. global market launch and trying to take as big a chunk out of that 27 billion units as we can. My name is Stefan Maisie. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Derma Health Solutions. And we are developing a brand new way to test for skin cancer without actually a biopsy. 
and without doing histopathology either. It's, it's literally a whole new way of looking at skin cancer. All right. To tell me more. <laughs> to tell you more. All right. So, so where do we begin? So I, I suppose look, our, our company is broken up into sort of little segments. So on the one hand, we are in uh, or considered industry 4.0 manufacturing where we've developed a very unique way of manufacturing uh, these tiny little micro needle structures. Um, and what's cool about these structures is that they can penetrate the skin uh, and you don't feel anything. So for those people who have needle phobia or fear of blood, like we tick all those boxes. But the idea is that you apply a bit of pressure onto the skin. These little um, structures penetrate the skin, maybe about a millimeter long or a millimeter in depth. Uh, and then when you remove them, these little structures collect you know, several skin cells. So there's some live tissue. Um, and from there, we can actually send that to a lab. And we've developed a, uh, a gene assay that can screen across the spectrum of skin cancers and detect tiny gene, uh, tiny gene changes uh, within this tissue to indicate if this uh, lesion or if, this, if these cells are cancerous. And the reason for this is about 40% of skin cancer biopsies are actually benign and could have been avoided. Now, 40%, you know, it does sound like a lot, but when we put into sort of larger numbers, there was about 600,000 mm. avoidable biopsies that were performed in Australia. Mm. Alone. Just last year. Yeah. So, I mean, they, these are really big numbers. And collectively, I mean, skin cancer is the leading global cancer. So if you combine all types of skin cancer, including the underreported basal of squamous cell carcinomas, like it's literally trumping every other cancer around the world. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So fine for those with needle phobia. Yep. Uh, cheaper in terms of pathology i imagine a cost saving there yeah so we're looking at about 30 percent cheaper than pathology uh we're not taking money away from pathology i think that was the biggest thing yep. like because people keep saying oh my god you have to be careful because you have pathology own this industry and i'm like well you know they do own the industry but there's also a really known backlog for biopsies like yeah. we've spoken to so many pathology firms and constantly the struggle is backlogs i mean this is where your know, liquid biopsies basically evolved because of a backlog in biopsies and we're sort of helping to change that as well because one of the biggest things is you know six hundred thousand biopsies could have been avoided there could have been a whole new way of doing it which means that people could have had access to better healthcare much quicker mm. yeah so so many applications there that's and does that i'm just having a think so um in terms of i guess most gps that will take um skin biopsies or take them out there has to be some sort of procedural um, space in that. Does that then allow the scope of every GP to be able to utilise this yeah. testing? So here's the thing. Right now we've found that about 20% of GPs actually don't perform uh, biopsies <laughs> just because of training. I mean, I, I've seen biopsies and they are, they're a lot more uh, full-on and graphic than mm. I had anticipated. It takes about 30 minutes. So it's a full-on procedure to cut it out. Um, and where our, our solution basically fits in is... It's the same item code as a biopsy, so we're not, the doctors aren't losing money. They can perform the procedure in about five minutes mm-hmm. as opposed to 30 minutes, which means doctors can actually see more patients in less time yeah. and actually increase their billable hours without actually causing unnecessary pain and suffering to the patient. It's sort of like a win-win all around. Yeah, absolutely, for everyone. Yep. Brilliant. So you've been here, um, we're at ARCS today, and you've been participating in the BioBeacon aspect. Can you tell me a little bit more about that in your... Participation in yeah, I mean, look, it's been pretty interesting. I mean, um, like we, we've to us, it sort of seems like we've popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, we've actually been sort of in stealth mode uh, for about four years, mm-hmm. um, and so Arc is the very first time we're actually uh, being vulnerable. Uh, and we're presenting in front of clinicians. So, yeah, we've spoken to clinicians here and there. We've spoken to doctors. And we know generally that yeah, it's okay. But I think this is the first time we're in an audience where they're mainly clinicians. Yeah. So their job is you know, you know, to listen, but also to try and tear us apart to figure out if there are any holes in what we're doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of fun. I kind of think we're prepared, but I really hope at the end of it, um, whatever the feedback we get, yeah, it's going to be able to help us move to the next milestone. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Health Tech. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this episode with someone who might find it valuable. For more information and resources about healthcare innovation, visit TalkingHealthTech.com.